Citizens in Benicia, California, who have been formally trained in a six-week emergency rescue course, continue their training on a quarterly basis. This training drill covers search and rescue techniques and hands-on extraction, removal, and search exercises. It is our hope that citizens who are unable to attend the training drills in person can use this video to supplement their ongoing training needs. Each drill consists of a classroom review to assure participant safety and refresher knowledge, followed by hands-on exercises. In all instances, we are aware that as a rescuer, we are the most important person, and we gather size up information to assure our safety so we can continue to rescue and assist as many people as possible. We begin with extraction. After sizing up the situation, no fewer than five rescuers perform extraction. The positions are team leader, an individual responsible for the overall safety and guidance of the team, a leverage person who will use a lever with a fulcrum to help move heavy pieces, and two cribbers who will crib debris to protect the victim and rescuers and allow for victim extraction. The fifth person is for medical support and victim comfort. This is an equally important role to help assure and comfort the victim and provide, if possible, any immediate and urgent first aid. As citizen volunteers, we understand that our duties are only for light search and rescue and that we equip ourselves with protective gloves, goggles, dust masks, helmet, and work boots. We use walkie-talkie, safety vests, ID tags, and other basic equipment. To extract victims, we use cribbing and leveraging techniques. We start with the lightly trapped victims before attempting to rescue more heavily trapped individuals. Cribbing is a strong wooden framework, if possible, of four by four blocks of wood that support debris and help alleviate pressure to the victim. Leveraging with a fulcrum works with cribbing to lift heavy material. This is a gradual process. The rule of thumb is lift an inch, crib an inch. After the rescue, raised objects are slowly lowered to prevent further accidents. Removal of victim. Teamwork and good communications are essential. For self-removal, we say, anyone who can stand up and move towards me, please do so. And then we provide them with further instructions on how to get out of the building of the situation safely. In a blanket carry, six rescuers are recommended. One rescuer is designated leader to ensure teamwork. We roll the victim on her or his side, position the rolled blanket or tarp along the back of the victim. We roll the victim onto the blanket, we position rescuers on each side, and the leader counts and team lifts on three. One, two, three. The blanket drag. Once the victim is positioned on the blanket or tarp, one to two people can drag the blanket and the victim to safety. In extreme cases, you can do a shoulder or a feet drag. This is for short distances only. We count to ensure coordination, and we determine where we are going before we start the process. Building markings. As rescuers enter the building, they mark their progress as they go through it. This is done by putting a slash near the door that they entered. And in the slash on the left-hand side, they enter their task force identifier. We use map page and quadrant numbers. On the top, we enter the date and time entered. And when we complete the search, we complete the X with the time left. On the right-hand side of the X, we indicate important personnel hazards and information, for example, person trapped, structural damage, top floor not searched, hazmat spill third floor. And on the bottom of the X, we indicate the number of live or dead victims and any information that would be relevant for others coming along after us, their names, their genders, and where we have removed them to if possible. When we size up a building, we are alert for hazards. Are there power lines, gas leaks, hazardous materials, overhead objects, holes in the floor, water, smoke? We do not enter a building where there is water or that we smell gas. There's a nine-step size-up process. The first is to gather facts, the time of day, the day of the week. At night and on the weekends, we know more people are at home. The amount of daylight available may affect our search and rescue operations. 
and the type of structure we're looking at. Is it an apartment, a residence, or a mobile home? The occupancy, how many people are inside, where are they located, and any special considerations for elderly, disabled, or children. Is our weather good, bad, or severe? And our hazards. Can we, do we know where the utility shutoffs are? In acts of terrorism, we never search and rescue. We clear the area. We can talk to bystanders and understand that they may be confused by the event. They may have pertinent information that will help us. The second step is to assess and communicate damage. Light damage is superficial, has broken windows, cracked windows, minor damage to interior contents. Our mission is to locate, triage, and prioritize removal of victims. In moderate damage, we see visible signs of the damage. Decorative work is damaged. There's cracks in the plaster, major damage to interior contents, but the building is still on the foundation. Our mission is to locate, triage, and immediately evacuate victims to a safe area. We minimize the number of rescuers in the building. Heavy damage, it's partial or total collapse, tilting, obvious structural instability, or the building is off the foundation. Our mission is to secure the perimeter, warn others of the danger, and do not enter. In our process of size up, we lap around the building, we look at all sides. If we're unsure of the amount of damage, we err on the safe side, assuming heavier damage. We communicate our findings to our BERT team. The third step is to consider probabilities. What could or would happen to our team? The fourth step is to assess the situation. Is it safe enough to continue? Steps five and six, we establish priorities, and then we determine what's to be done first before beginning our search and rescue. Step seven, we, we develop an action plan, and the team leader is the one who decides personnel and resource development. Uh, we write it down, we keep it simple, we keep notes to focus our search and rescue and to document it. Steps eight and nine, we take action, evaluate progress. We know that size up is continuous. The search itself avoids duplication of effort and documents the results. We call out to victims, we use a systematic search pattern, we stop frequently, listen for noise, we triangulate, we mark entrances to search areas, and we report our results. Team two is uh, entering, doing a left side search. Now remember to look under furniture. Team one, hand. exiting first bedroom, everything is clear. All is good. This is team two. We found a dog in the kitchenette in the left side of the main room. Bringing it out. Team leader cover. Well, he looks happy to see us. Team one, team leader, exiting second bedroom. Get the dog out right away. Both of you stay together. Take your victim out. And give the victim to your team leader and then go on with your search. Checking the hallway, all was clear. Team leader, come. 